Welcome to worship. Happy Heart's Day. Happy Valentine's Day. Our hope is that wherever you are watching this recording, that, you're, that you and your loved ones are cozy and warm. May your hearts also be warm by this service. May the scriptures, stories, songs lift your heart to God. May God be your Valentine. You are always God's. Blessings, and we'll begin worship, like always, with song. worship. As we come, let us give thanks. Our God has bent down and fed us. Like a mother, God has held us. Our God has calmed and quieted our fears. Like a father, God has forgiven us and removed our sins from us. Bless God's holy name. May we never forget God's graciousness. Please join me in our opening prayer. Holy and merciful Savior, your radiance dispels the darkness in which we live. Your majesty stuns us to silence. You humble us to our knees. As we behold your glory, all else fades away. Help us in our worship today to see beyond our preconceptions and expectations of God who wants us to be comfortable. Instead, give us faith to see worship, the Lord of the universe, the creator of all that is, the sustainer of our lives, the redeemer who reigns in power even now. Amen. This is story for all ages. Uh, the, the Ostrich in Love from Fables by Arnold Global. Just a, a delightful story I want to share with you, or actually a fable that I'd like to share with you. I think it's going to be up in the corner here, if I'm not mistaken. Before I read it, though, I was looking at journey notes this past week, and in Scripture, in 1 Corinthians 16, 14, it says, everything should be done in love. Isn't that appropriate for today? And I also was just going through some books. It's Valentine's Day. And a couple of just fun little poems. I hope you don't mind that I share them with you. The first one is, it's Valentine's Day. It's Valentine's Day, and this, in the streets there's freezing rain and slush and sleet. The wind is fierce. The skies are gray. I don't think I'll go out today. But here inside the weather's warm. There's no trace of wind or storm. And you just made my morning shine. You said you'd be my valentine. 
<laughs> just kind of a cute one. Story for all ages, though. I chose the ostrich in love. I hope you enjoy it as much as I do from Fables. It happens like this. On Sunday, the ostrich saw a young lady walking in the park. He fell in love with her at once. How oh, sweet. He followed behind her in a, at a distance, putting his feet in the very places that she had stepped. Oh. On Monday, the ostrich gathered violets as a gift to his beloved. He was too shy to give them to her. He left them at the door and ran away. But there was great joy in his heart. On Tuesday, the ostrich composed a song for his beloved. He sang it over and over. He thought it was the most beautiful music he had ever heard. On Wednesday, the ostrich watched his beloved dining in a restaurant. He forgot to order supper himself. He was too happy to be hungry. On Thursday, the ostrich wrote a poem to his beloved. It was the first poem he had ever written. But he did not have the courage to read it to her. On Friday, the ostrich bought a new suit of clothes. He fluffed his feathers, feeling fine and handsome. He hoped that his beloved might notice. On Saturday, the ostrich dreamed that he was waltzing with his beloved in a great ballroom. He held her tightly as they whirled around and around to the music. He awoke feeling wonderfully alive. On Sunday, the ostrich returned to the park. When he saw the young lady walking there, his heart fluttered wildly. But he said to himself, Alas, it seems that I am much too shy for love. Perhaps another time will come. Yet surely this has been a week well spent. Hmm. The moral of this fable, love can be its own reward. My take on it is, as I ponder these words, you know, the ostrich might be shy, but you know, we as Christians are not shy. We accept God's love and we return it to God and those all around us. Blessings and happy Valentine's Day. You read.
Hello, and welcome back to one of our virtual worships. For the last several weeks since Epiphany began, we have been focusing and exploring the theme of Rooted and Renewed. Next Sunday, we will begin a new series, Claim the Promise. We hope that you'll be with us uh, each and every week, and that you'll also join us for our first time back in our sanctuary for face-to-face -face worship except for uh, funerals and baptisms and uh, membership uh, vows that we've had being taken in our sanctuary over the last uh, nine to 10 months. But this Ash Wednesday is our very first worship service and our worship will be held at 1215 or 615 and you are welcome to come to either one of them. The following Sunday, we will begin Claim the Promise, and I hope that you'll join us either virtually, if you're more comfortable that way, or in our sanctuary according to our COVID protocols, and that you'll follow with this series. God has given us so many blessings, and we want to be able to claim the promise. Now, if you will, let us turn to our scripture passage, and I am reading this morning from Mark 9 beginning with the second verse and reading on through the end of the eighth. Six days later, Jesus took with him Peter and James and John and led them up a high mountain apart by themselves. And he was transfigured before them, and his clothes became dazzling white, such as no one on earth could bleach them. And there appeared to him Elijah with Moses, who were talking with Jesus. Then Peter said to Jesus, Rabbi, it is good for us to be here. Let us make three dwellings, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. He did not know what to say, for they were terrified. And then a cloud overshadowed them, and from the cloud there came a voice. This is my son, my beloved Listen to him. Suddenly, when they looked around, they saw no one with them anymore, only Jesus. Here ends a reading from God's holy word. Would you pause and pray with me this morning? Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of each one of these, your children, be found this day acceptable in your sight, O Lord, for truly you are the rock and you are the redeemer. Amen. As we turn to this story from our 21st century world, a science-centered world, this Bible lesson is a strange one, isn't it? We are told that Jesus' appearance changed as three disciples looked on. His clothing took on a brilliant luminescence. In the book, Mark for Everyone, Mike Bible scholar N.T. Wright puts it this way, his clothes shone with a whiteness that no laundry on earth could match. It really sounds like a Hollywood special effect. And to add to that movie image, two big actors 
in the Jewish scriptures, Elijah and Moses make a cameo appearance too. And yet the focus is on Jesus, only Jesus. The scene shifts as a disembodied voice speaks out of a cloud and says, this is my son, the one I love, listen to him. And suddenly the disciples looked around and saw nobody there anymore, only Jesus with them. Now, what did Mark want us to know? And more importantly, what does God want to tell us? Well, in order to gain a handhold on this Bible lesson, let's contemplate how Jesus was transfigured, how his appearance changed on the mountain that day. Piercing light apparently emanated from his person. What does that teach us? Well, we know that the sun is the center of our solar system and the source of power that gives us life. But you know, for most of human history, we really didn't understand much about the sun. Until fairly recently, human beings appreciated the sun's light every morning and basked in its warmth, but didn't think of it as this power source that it is. And now? Well, now you can get a tax credit for solar panels that continue to pop up around the world to provide energy in your home. Light therapy treats patients with suffering from T-cell lymphomas and other skin concerns. The day is coming when spacecraft pushed only by light photons from the sun will reach speeds of one-tenth the speed of light, about 67 million miles per hour. That's fast. For thousands of years, humans underestimated the size of the sun, thinking it was much smaller than the Earth. The Greek philosopher Anaxorix thought the sun was just a few times bigger than the territory of modern-day Greece. Think how small that is. The mathematician and astronomer Ptolemy calculated that the sun was bigger than the Earth, but only about 150 times larger. But finally, in 1672, astronomers calculated correctly the size of the sun's volume and found that that volume is 1.3 million times bigger than the volume of the Earth. Now, to give you an idea of that scale, picture a baseball, which is about three inches in diameter. If the Earth is the size of a baseball, then the sun is a ball with a diameter of 25 feet. That's big. But so what? Well, many people today fail to grasp the effect of the sun on our day-to-day -day lives. Flare-ups on the sun can affect Earth's magnetic field and can mess with power line currents. Entire energy grids oil pipelines, and our satellite TV reception. The bottom line, the sun is powerful, big, and able to affect our day-to-day -day lives, just like Jesus, only like Jesus. The Gospels of Mark and Matthew tell us that one day Jesus led three disciples, Peter, James, and John, up a mountain. And while there, those disciples saw Jesus transfigured before them, and they witnessed the power of sunlight, S-O-N, of God. The word transfigure is hardly one we use every day. To be transfigured is to be transformed, to undergo a metamorphosis, to change in appearance, condition, or form. Changes of appearance like the one described in Mark don't occur every day. In this story, Jesus went from being an ordinary, normal-looking, Galilean Jewish peasant to an extraordinary, dazzling figure. The disciples looked at him, and they must have thought, this is big. But before they could focus on that energy flowing out of Jesus, two others showed up. Identified as Moses and Elijah, the heavy hitters in the Old Testament, representatives of God's law and God's prophecy. 
Now, the fact that Jesus was talking with them should signal to us that he was on their level. Jesus' ministry fulfilled what God had been doing for centuries through the law and through the prophets, and for millennia through the people of Israel. Seeing roots and sensing renewal, the disciples probably thought, this is big. While the disciples sputtered over what to do next, a bright cloud overshadowed them, and a voice said, This is my son, the beloved. Listen to him. And the disciples fell to the ground to be raised up by Jesus' touch. And as the disciples rose, they thought, This Jesus is the Son, the Son of God. He's powerful, he's big, and God wants us to listen to him. On the day of the transfiguration, the disciples began in a new way to grasp the power of sunlight. Is it possible that we have underestimated the magnitude, the power, the effect of Jesus Christ on our lives? We have been like the ancient Greeks, looking up into the sky, ignorant of the fact that the sun is 1.6, no, 1.3 million times bigger than the Earth and able to push spacecraft at breathtaking speeds. Let us start to see, as we eye into the Lenten season, Jesus for who he really is, the greatest of God's forces, at the very center of the universe. We can only begin to see these truths in the light of his resurrection. As Jesus warned Peter, James, and John not to speak of what they had seen and heard until the Son of Man has been raised from the dead. Now a generation after Jesus is resurrected, the Apostle Paul will write in his letter to the Colossians about Christ's greatness, Christ's power, and the daily effect of Christ on our lives. Paul wrote about Christ's cosmic significance by saying, he is the image of the invisible God. In him all things in heaven and earth were created, things visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or powers, All things have been created through him and for him, only Jesus. Paul wrote of Christ's power, For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, and through him God was pleased to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, by making peace through the blood of his cross. Only Jesus And regarding Christ's effect on our daily lives, Paul wrote, And you who were once estranged and hostile in mind, doing evil deeds, he has now reconciled you wholly through his fleshly body, through death, so as to present you holy and blameless and irreproachable through him. Only Jesus Now, this is not the fleeting, feeble kind of power for which politicians strive. Neither is it the kind of power that issues from the business end of a fist, the barrel of a gun, or the blast of an IED. The power upon which we gaze with Peter, James, and John is authentic, creative. It is the power that builds up, that rectifies, that reconciles. This is power with a capital P that emanates from the source of holiness and dwarfs everything else by comparison. This is the power that laughs at the conspiracies of nations and the plots of people, that holds their boasts and games in derision. This is the power that overwhelms, overshadows, overpowers all other power. It is the power of a transcendent God who comes to us fully in Jesus Christ. This is the power that confronted Job in the whirlwind and Moses on Mount Sinai. This is the power present at creation that divided the waters into seas and created life on earth. This is the power that first breathed life into the human soul. 
And now, well, we know why Peter, James, and, a John, and John were awed and afraid that day. Because they were in the presence of real power, just as we are. Stand neck deep in the ocean and try not to feel small. Stand close enough to a great blaze and feel the heat on your face and try not to feel vulnerable. Watch a tornado reduce a barn to matchsticks and try not to feel helpless. Hold your child in your arms for the very first time and try not to feel just a little bit weak in the knees. Stand before the transcendent one Feel the power of God's spirit as it passes over you and holds you. Hear the pitch and roll of God's voice and just try to stay on your feet. This is the power of the same Jesus, the same son of God, who invites you to root yourselves deeply within him and in his word and be renewed through his power. Only Jesus. Accepting Jesus as the Messiah, the Son of the one God, can strengthen us for the journey ahead, just as surely as the three disciples were strengthened, rooted, and renewed, as Jesus set his face toward Jerusalem. Join us in the Lenten journey ahead, won't you? Claim the promise and live in the world as one transformed by Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Please keep the following people in your prayers this week. Betty, Jan, Judy, Nancy, baby Eli, baby Addison, Anne, Howard, Jean, and Jerry, Mitch, Britt, and their unborn baby girl, Gail and Paul, Scott and Gail, Bill and family on the passing of his sister, and Bob's family on his passing. This week we celebrate with the following people. Happy birthday to Toby, Mox, Lexi, Marvel, Shirley, Grace, and Tristan. And happy anniversary today to Dennis and Tammy. This week, the church office will be closed on Monday to observe President's Day. Tuesday night at 6.30 p.m., the stewardship team will meet via Zoom. Wednesday, we will hold in-person Ash Wednesday services at 12.15 and 6.15 p.m. Please RSVP to Beth in the office to reserve your space and worship. The Faithful and Inclusive class will meet online Wednesday night at 7 p.m. And Reva's Bible study will meet Thursday morning at 10 a.m. in the fireside room here at the church. And as always, your offerings can be dropped off at the church with Beth between the hours of 8 a.m. and 2.30 p.m. You can mail them in to 885 Pembina Trail, or you can give online through our website at dlumc.org. Thank you. As we turn to our time of prayer, I invite you to begin that prayer in deep silence as you consider your own needs, the needs of our fragile world, our nation, our community, our families and friends. Truly, we have been hard pressed the last several months with racial strife, injustice, vision of the future, and of course the pandemic. Let us be in silence as we pray together. Almighty God, we offer our lives to you as we enter your presence. 
aware, so aware that we approach you from a world that chooses to walk in darkness apart from you. Each one of us has ignored, perhaps even denied, the enlightening power and transfiguration of Jesus Christ. We confess now our sin to you, God of power and might. Penetrate our darkness by the power of Christ's luminescence, his light, that we may live in the joy of knowing and loving you and each other. We pray, O Lord, this day for all who have been part of our care ministry. We pray for those who are in leadership of our institutions of power. Be with our bishops, our president, our elected officials, our volunteers in this world. We pray, O Lord, for persons who have struggled with health, who know firsthand the difficulties of grief, or who are actively dying. Bless, O Lord, Bill and Diane, Gwen, Stephanie, Paul, and their children as we mourn the death of Bob this week. Be with us all, O Lord, we pray, as we pray the prayer that Jesus taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Receive now the benediction. Who are we? We are a missionary force of Christians. What do we do? Offer the care and compassion of Christ. To whom? To all. Where do we meet you? Wherever you are on life's journey. And so go forth. Be replenished by the grace and mercy of God blessed by the healing love of Jesus, energized by the limitless power of the Holy Spirit, and begin your Lenten journey on Wednesday with your friends and family at DLUMC. Amen? Amen.